but everyone's on recession watch. They're looking at what's happening with inflation. We have CPI over 9%. We've got the Fed continuing on with raising interest rates. And these are things that companies are very nervous about. So yes, we would expect in the current environment to see more companies delaying earnings, not even necessarily as a sign that they're going to report bad news, but sometimes they're just pumping the brakes to figure out what is going on. You're listening to Traders Insight Radio by Interactive Brokers. Find more podcasts and daily market commentary at tradersinsight.news. Please remember any trading discussions are for information purposes only and are not intended to portray recommendations. Please listen to further disclosures at the end of today's episode. Now, welcome to our show. Let's get started. Hello, and welcome to IBKR Traders Insight Radio podcast. I'm Stephen Levine, Senior Market Analyst at Interactive Brokers and your host for today's program. We'll be talking with Christine Short, Wall Street Horizons Vice President of Research, about the current bear market we've been witnessing and how certain corporate body language can affect risk sentiment and ultimately have an influence over the performance of stocks. Welcome, Christine. Great to have you here with us. Thank you so much for having me. Excited to chat. Yeah, me too. Me too. You really gave a, a terrific presentation on our IBCare webinars platform back in August, I think last year, about corporate body language. It involves certain event data you might find on a financial calendar like earnings or dividend announcements, investor conferences, things like that, and how investors can use activity that involves these scheduled dates to help gain insights into the overall financial health of a company. This is what I understand. Now, we've been experiencing quite a downturn uh, to date this year, right? I mean, the S&P is down around 20%. NASDAQ plunged more than 27%. Uh, and some sectors in the S&P, like consumer discretionary, for example, down over 30%. And retail select industry index has shed about 34%. I mean, I can go on. And we'll circle back to these later in our discussion. But for now, I'd, I'd really like to get a handle on how corporate body language or these signals coming from companies that you track, how does that work exactly in terms of making some decisions about a company's or, or sector's financial health? What are your insights there? Yeah, so corporate body language, as you've mentioned, this is a term we've kind of coined that represents what we call the nonverbal cues a company gives the marketplace about their financial well-being, and they can be either intentional or unintentional. A lot of times companies don't even realize they're doing it. Okay. Um, they are typically seen, as you mentioned, when a company changes a date, they revise something, either an earnings date or they change the content of an event that they're involved in. So, um, for example... Um, we mainly track earnings dates. We find that data to be most impactful. Um, and what we're looking at is are companies reporting at the same time that they have historically, or are they moving an earnings date up? Are they pushing it back? And as we'll get to later in the podcast, there's some academic research that says you should be paying attention to those moves. Um, and beyond that, when you're looking at investor conferences and events, um, are they attending events? Uh, are they attending the same events as their peers? Do they have uh, a speaker? Is it someone in the C-suite? Is it someone a little lower down the, you know, the ranks there? Um, do they change their speaker last minute? So it's all these very small nuanced changes. And, and we're not saying it always necessarily means something, but the more information you have, the better. Um, and you use it within your mosaic, we like to say, of financial data and other bespoke data sets. But um, it's understanding that these changes are happening and at least being aware of them so that you can make um, a sort of informed decision, whether you're, you know, trading, um, investing in these companies. And we'll get into some of the, like I said, academic research later on. Um, but the, uh, when we're talking about earning states, the ideas that if a company is reporting later than usual, well, it tends to be a bad sign. And when they're reporting a little bit earlier than they historically have, it means that there could be good news on the horizon. So this activity, you can sort of factor into your calculus or your risk profile about a certain company or sector, depending on the activity that's being conducted around these dates. That's correct. It's just one piece um, in your like I said, mosaic of, of yeah. how you're valuing the company. And um, obviously, you're not going to use this in a silo. You're going to put this along with other data sets. Um, but a lot of the time, and again, we'll get to some data around this, but about two thirds of the time we do find when it comes to earnings dates, um, directionally, 
the data we're collecting does tell you something about where the company is heading. So I mean, I'd love to hear maybe an example or two of a company that's proven this out. What's happened exactly? Okay, yeah, I'll give you a couple of recent scenarios. So first, let me talk about the metrics that we um, that we use to kind of measure whether a company is reporting early, whether they're reporting late. It's called the date breaks factor. It's a Wall Street Horizon proprietary measure. We use a modified Z-score protocol, um, and that looks at the standard deviations from the norm, and it captures really to what extent um, a confirmed earnings date deviates or breaks from a historical trend for the same quarter. So we look back five years, um, and if the date breaks factor is negative, well, it means the earnings date is confirmed to be later than the historical average while positives earlier. Um, so let me give you an example from Q1 earnings season, which was uh, just this last quarter, um, Hyatt. So they had a earnings date that moved a week later than usual. Um, when the conference call came around, they reported a net loss of 73 million and you saw the stock fall in the post earnings drift period. What I thought was interesting about this one is it wasn't an industry uh, wide problem because you saw Hilton, Wyndham, Starwood, they all posted profits. So this would have given you insight had you had the date breaks factor of negative three, which negative three meaning um, that's the worst reading you can have, meaning they have really deviated from when they historically would report earnings and you should definitely pay attention. It's kind of like a red alert. Um, so it was interesting to me that this isn't an industry-wide issue. This is a high issue, and we want to we want to look at high in this particular quarter. Um, I'll give you another example of of a, what we call a negative date breaks, and that was eBay from the fourth quarter. Um, now we were kind of looking at this, um, you know, not as oh this for sure means something. Uh, they did have a CFO change last year, so we were aware that when there's a management change, yeah, dates move. Sometimes a new CFO comes in and decides, you know, we're not reporting on the second Tuesday of the quarter anymore. I want to report on this date. Yeah. Um, so yeah. again, this is where being aware of a company and, and knowing about a company um, is helpful rather than just taking this as a complete signal. Uh, but anyhow, for the fourth quarter, eBay confirmed an earnings date that was nearly two weeks later than usual. That was very unusual for them. And while earnings per share and revenues did come in slightly ahead of expectations, they warned of slowing growth in the year ahead. Um, they kind of blamed it on declining consumer base due to uh, pent up demand for brick and mortar shopping yeah. post COVID-19 yeah. pandemic, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> Welcome back to the mall, I guess, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's a revival for some of those places. <laughs> it sounded like a bit of a scapegoat excuse because we've seen other e-commerce continue to do well. But anyhow, the stock fell. It fell about 6% in the days following the report. And, you know, they they beat their headline numbers. So even it's not always we know uh, when we look at quarterly earnings, it's backwards looking. You really want to look for it at the guidance and the guidance for eBay wasn't great going forward. Um, so those are two negative examples. We do tend to see more companies delay earnings than advance, but I'll quickly leave you with a positive example from Q4. Um, staying kind of within the travel and leisure sector like Hyatt, we had park hotels and resorts. Um, they were post spinoff with Hilton. So again, maybe things were changing because you know a lot of times we see either in a spinoff environment or an M&A environment, there will be a bit of a shakeup uh, as to when companies are reporting. Um, however, they advanced their earnings date by a week. They had a massive beat on the top and bottom line, and the stock went up 4% in the post uh, three-day earnings drift. So there's an example of the flip side of things when a company actually advances earnings, and then they come out, and it's because they had such good news, they couldn't wait to share it with the marketplace. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really amazing to see, especially for park hotels and resorts, and especially within the hotel industry in general. And you mentioned Hilton, Wyndham, Starwood during pandemic. They were struggling, as you can imagine, with occupancy rates and all that. It's very interesting to see such a positive example from park hotels and resorts. Really interesting stuff. But let's go back a bit because you mentioned there's been some academic research conducted on this. Can you elaborate a bit on that? What are some of the studies that have been done on this? Yeah, so the main study we refer to, I believe last time it was updated was 2016. Um, it's called Time Will Tell, Information in the Timing of Scheduled Earnings News. That was from Eric So of MIT and Travis Johnson from the University of Texas. And they demonstrated exactly what, I, what I've been speaking of. Earnings calendars have strong predictive powers for firms' earnings news and future returns. Um, specifically, when you're looking at 
uh, you know, an earnings announcement that has is earlier than usual, that tends to correlate with good news, then delaying expected earnings dates tends to correlate with bad news. And what they found was advancers, those that pulled their earnings dates earlier than, you know, historically uh, they had been reporting, those outperformed delayers by more than two and a half percent in the month after those revisions are observed. So where returns track reported earnings news and, and you know are concentrated at the time of announcement. So that was kind of the beginning of, yeah, there is something in, in this news that not only does it correlate with good or bad news in, in many cases, but there is an actual movement in those stocks above you know the advancers versus the delayers. So, so that's one of the big papers that we refer to when we're collecting this data. So essentially, I'm seeing these as indicators the date changes. I think you mentioned earlier that the date break factors, about two thirds of the time, they're directionally accurate. Is that right? What makes or breaks the date break factor? I mean, why is it that some of the time they're accurate, some of the time they're not? And how can you count on them exactly? Or can you? Yeah. So let me first clarify when I when I talk about the date break, it's in and of itself an outlier. So anytime we flag something, it's an outlier, and so we're not, you know, using the entire universe. So we only flag those that significantly deviate from the normal reporting time. And right. uh, we try to go six years back. I mean, we have data going back to 2006, but we'd like to use more recent data because, uh, you know, things certainly change over a 15, 16 year history. So you can't rely on the entire history. You'd like to go back at least four quarters. Um, yeah. And like I said, yeah, it doesn't it doesn't hold true in all cases. Um, it is two thirds of the time. That's what we've observed. But again, there's other reasons for changing a date that has nothing to do with financial performance, like a change in CFO or management, like M&A activity, spinoffs, or simply an error. You know, we've had instances where one of our analysts have noticed, hey, you know, company XYZ always reports on the second Tuesday of the quarter. Uh, this quarter, they have confirmed an earnings date for Thursday. Let's call them up. They call up the IR department, and in fact, it's just a mistake. So. <laughs> Um, so we try to do a lot of that digging on our own just because we know these companies so intimately that we can pinpoint the exact day that we expect them to report, but there's certainly a variety of other reasons. And that's why we say, yeah, it's not always accurate. So what I would do is anytime I see a, a really significant date breaks factor, so that would be positive three or negative three companies really uh, advancing their earnings more than usual. That's a positive three, negative three, meaning they're delaying more than usual. I'd look into that more. Has there been a change in management, a new CFO, any M&A activity that could impact or, or be the reason that they're changing this date, that they're you know, changing their speaker at a conference, et cetera. And so you know, you wanna do a little more digging around those things. But, and I also look at the trajectory of the company. What are, what's guidance look like? What are analysts saying? Yep. Um, and so I kind of put together the full picture. And if the date breaks factor is, is supporting either one way or the other, I use that in there. But if it seems like everything's going one way, date breaks is saying something else, I try to investigate why that might be. And again, sometimes they just decide to change their date. There might not be a reason, but about, you know, 67% of the time we find there, there is a reason for it. It makes sense to me that if a company is undergoing a significant amount of stress and you follow that company, then you and they change their date to a certain, uh, you know, maybe a couple of weeks out or something like that, uh, you kind of can anticipate perhaps uh, that could be bad news. But to dig into it is, a, is a t- an entirely different story. You just never know. But does it matter the, um, the amount of delayed earnings that the company does? I mean, let's say it's like, you know, two to three days versus a few weeks or a month. They change an announcement date, say, a, a month uh, out. Does that matter? Or does it Does it even happen? What would those kinds of differences allude to, if anything? Yeah, so I'd say this is very company dependent. You know, you have companies that they swing every which way, right? Sometimes they report this week. Sometimes they report that. And it's insignificant, right? Because they're very volatile with when they decide to report earnings. And then there are are others that are very disciplined. Um, The banks, for example, they always confirm earnings, uh, you know, either on their call or the day after their, their current quarterly call, they'll confirm for a quarter out. And so, you know, certainly if you saw one of the banks not doing that, you'd, you know, that doesn't even have to uh, do with when they're confirming earnings for it's just the fact that are they confirming earnings, right? So there are some that are very disciplined, certain companies, and then others that are not. 
Um, what I'll say is there is academic research, another paper, it's called Is There News in the Timing of Earnings Announcements? That was Josh Limnit of NYU and Li Zhang at Rutgers. And they focus their study on dates that were at least four days away from the tentative forecasted date, so either earlier or later, and they found those delays and advances to be the most meaningful. Huh. I think sometimes something else I focus on is, uh, is it one week out or is exactly, you know, one week, if it's seven days, are they rolling it over to the, the next Tuesday because of where it falls in the calendar? I think you see this more in Q1 because fourth quarter earnings that are happening in the first yes, quarter. So yes. you've got the new year, you've got uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Day, you know, you've got some, some federal holidays in there, you've got President's Day. And so we always find that quarter reporting is a little bit longer and, and companies kind of move around a little bit more. But as a rule of thumb, it, you really got to look at the company, what they've been doing historically. And then, you know, is it four days or more? Yeah, that sometimes that will tell you, well, that is significant. If it's a day or two, um, it might not mean anything to the specific company. So again, you just have to know the names that you're looking into. And if you're doing the proper research, you, you, that's something you might know. Um, but for now, we're just kind of looking company specific and is it something more than four or five days? And does that kind of set off an alert in our heads? Like, Oh, we really should pay attention to this one. Cause it's, it's more than we typically see. Yeah. I think anyone casually looking at this might think these numbers are somewhat arbitrary, but they're really not. I mean, there's been these studies done, as you've mentioned, that really point to the significance of certain numbers of days, this four threshold, for example, I think, I think it's very valuable to lean on these kinds of indicators and in, in these kinds of specific ways. But, you know, another variable, I suppose, is the kind of event where the date gets moved. I mean, for example, a, a change in earnings announcement, does that have a, a more or less of an effect, you know, on the performance, say, of a stock than, say, a dividend change or an investor conference move? Is the type of event weighted in terms of its value? Yeah, we haven't specifically done research on the type of event. We, we just anecdotally find that the most impactful changes to track our earnings date changes. Um, that's what we most closely follow. It's what investors care about the most. We recently did a, a client survey and the majority of respondents ranked earnings announcements, and earnings date changes as the top two corporate events they found important to follow. Yep. Um, but again, that's, that's uh, you know, use those other events as, as parts of your story. Um, I like to use kind of investor conferences or, or things of that nature uh, in peer comparison. Like if you have a a tech company that is not participating in one of the main industry events, but all of their peers are, what does that say about the one that's not participating? Um, and so you can do it by a process of elimination as well, right? Um, so now we, we do mostly focus on earnings dates, but of course there's a ton of events that companies hold. Um, and it's gotten a little dicey, obviously, the last couple of years because of COVID and whether or not they're holding them at all or are they virtual versus in person? So we've done a bunch of research around that. Um, and so uh, just, again, more information for you to have on these companies and, and do with it what you will. But I'd say for sure, tracking earnings dates and those changes, those revisions are, are the most impactful changes that, that investors can follow. So they decided to have an investor conference uh, for certain types of companies, let's say they're media companies. And one of the media companies in that industry decided they weren't going to show up to the, the Zoom call. It was a virtual call. Mm -hmm. And they didn't have their CEO or the scheduled speaker. Maybe it was the CEO or CFO was scheduled, but they, they had no representative whatsoever. And they just said, okay, we're bowing out of this. That sounds like something of a red flag. Yeah. You know, we did some work on this last year on TripAdvisor, just when the online travel uh, names were kind of ramping back up, people were getting more comfortable traveling again. And we started to see movement in that segment. Um, there were a bunch of, bank-sponsored media and tech conferences um, that TripAdvisor specifically, I think it was the beginning of March last year, there was a Deutsche Bank, a Morgan Stanley, a Bank of America, I think I have those right. Um, and they're all kind of around the beginning of March and a lot of the OTAs participate in them, but only TripAdvisor was speaking at all three. Um, I think they had someone very high up like the CFO participating. So we always kind of more heavily weight that. And then if you looked at Booking or you looked at Travel Zoo or, or some of the other names there, um, they might be at one uh, or, or Expedia. Um, they might be at one, but they weren't at all. Some of them weren't at any. And then we found in the consequent quarters, months, 
um, TripAdvisor ended up outperforming. And so, huh. um, you know, it's it's perception is reality, right? Yeah. Even if TripAdvisor's not doing great, just the fact that they show up makes it look a little better, right? So they're out there, they're in the media, they're addressing things. Um, if I know nothing about TripAdvisor, I, I think that's a good sign, right? That they're Absolutely. being invited and in, in, yeah. par- in participating. So again, their their balance sheet could be terrible. And if I know nothing <laughs> about that, I just, they're more visible. They're also um, directing the narrative. You know, if their CFO is getting out there and, and talking, well, then other people can't talk for them because he's out there doing it. And so yeah. some of the other names that chose not to participate um, well, now there's rumblings about them on Wall Street, you know, like, well, they didn't they didn't show up. So um, that's one other I'd say uh, I'm not sure that companies I'm sure they do. They think about how to control their narrative. But um, I don't know that they know if investors are really tracking where they where they are and where they're not. But that's certainly something that we've been following. So we have all this context now about corporate body language. So. Let's talk about the current market we're in. I mean, we already touched on some of the losses we've been seeing, right, in this bear market. I mean, it's just been brutal. And I imagine there's been a, a great deal of activity, right? I mean, what, what have you been seeing in, in this bear market? I mean, has there been an uptick in the number of cases of certain events, you know, maybe more than others, you know, maybe more than before we started uh, really seeing this downturn and all this volatility? For example, I mean, have there been, say, more earnings announcement delays, for example, uh, now, uh, more than before the the bear market downturn. Yeah, so we're certainly starting to see the pendulum swing, right? It's not dire yet. Um, We have an index called the Leary. It's the Late Earnings Report Index. It tracks a number of late reporters versus early. Uh, The baseline is 100. So anytime you get over 100, you kind of got to start to worry like, okay, more of these outliers are late reporters versus early. And for the last five quarters, when we were in that great post-COVID or post-lockdown really bull market, um, we had more advanced companies advancing earnings than we had delaying. And as I mentioned, that historically is not the case. Usually for every one company um, that is advancing, we have a little more than one company delaying. So it's it's like 1.1 1, 1. 1 is the ratio really. Um, so after five quarters of having more advancers and delayers, we're right on par now for the current, you know, second quarter that's reporting for, you know, every one company that's delaying, we've got one advancing. And so we're starting to see that trough kind of form. The good days that companies have enjoyed over the last really year and a half seem to be coming to an end. Not to say that it's this like blazing red signal at this point, but we're starting to see it change slightly quarter to quarter. And to me, that just shows companies are uncertain about the second half of the year. They don't know what they're going into. We're starting to see second half expectations come down. We're starting to see 2023. Got a few banks out already. Um, Bank of America are expecting negative earnings growth next year. So some of those numbers are starting to flip. Um, It's not happening immediately, but everyone's on recession watch. They're looking at what's happening with inflation. We have CPI over 9%. We've got the Fed continuing on with raising interest rates. And these are things that companies are very nervous about. So yes, we would expect in the current environment to see more companies delaying earnings, not even necessarily as a sign that they're going to report bad news, but sometimes they're just pumping the brakes to figure out what is going on. And in one metric I'll mention, it's kind of the pre- confirmation is something we track called confirmation timing. Not necessarily are companies confirming for a date that's historically in line, but are they confirming at all? Like I mentioned with the banks, banks always confirm from the day after or during their conference call. We're starting to see some companies, you know, kind of not confirm when we usually see them, which to me is the precursor, right? So um, let's, let's think 3M, Intel, Costco, those are three big names. They always confirm earnings the day after they report the last quarter. And they were all late confirmers. They've all since confirmed for the second quarter, but just in the last week. So for us, that's even a very early kind of red flag, like, oh, these companies aren't even committing to an earnings date. And I think to me, that signals, they're just trying to figure out, get a, get a grasp on what's happening and uh, kind of taking in all of their information to figure out how are we going to give guidance? Like, what's the picture going to look like second half of the year? You know, once you get to this July reporting period, it's really pivotal because investors are expecting to see second half and even early 2023 guidance. 
Um, so, so for now, like I said, we're about one to one ratio of advancers versus delayers, but we are starting to see some more companies, even those very high profile, um, hold back on even confirming at all. Wow, you know that just adds to that uncertainty. The non-committal to the to the confirmation is is a very interesting early red flag. You know, especially with what we're dealing with, as you mentioned, all of those economic data points have been very, very dire to, uh, especially you know, certain sectors like consumer discretionary, as we mentioned earlier. Really, really unfortunate how this is all turning out, but. But let's say bull markets. We can be a little bit more uplifting here and and think about, uh, you know, corporate body language in a bull market. If we're talking about this gains, right, to the same extent as these losses that we're seeing, are the signals effectively at the same volumes but in reverse? I mean, how how does that work exactly? How does volatility, uh, either positive or negative swings, typically affect event dates? So like I said, we've got, you know, data going back to 2006. Um, Really, the date breaks factor that I've been speaking about, um, we can look back, I think currently we're looking back at 10 years of data, and historically over those 10 years, yeah, there's always more delayers. That's what we've noticed, despite the markets. Um, but certainly, you know, we are in a different place right now. And and we were we were in 2020, there was there was a quick two quarter downturn bear market. But for for most data companies uh, we've been collecting throughout a 10-year bull market and then we had that brief two-quarter downturn and and then we were back up and so now you're right Um, it's different and that's the tricky part about collecting data is that it you know a lot of stuff worked for those 10 years and now we see does it work the same way in a bear market so what we're seeing right now is yes more companies are reporting later because of that uncertainty that i mentioned but it's also that they're not even confirming at all. And so we do see that that holds steady. When the environment is a little bit uncertain, we see more delayers, um, we see less companies confirming, we see less companies confirming other things like shareholder meetings or um, you know attending less investor conferences because they don't want to be out there as much. Mm. Um, haven't necessarily noticed, noticed that volatility impacts these numbers either directionally or the volume of outliers we see. Um, but I think the story holds true because it's been like volatile forever now, right? Like the last couple of years have yeah. been up and down in every which way, right? It's I like hadn't noticed. I don't, I don't know. I, I think everything's <laughs> kind of like, you know, just a, a new normal. So we're all living in the fat yeah. tails, you know. That's, right. Yeah. It's, the, the fat tails are, are the normal. So, you know, volatility is just, uh, you know, swing high, swing low. That's normal. <laughs> it's fine, right? Yeah. It's all fine. Um, don't get too emotional about it. But... Um, yeah, so we, we have seen the, the story plays out, whether you're in a bull market, a bear market, um, the, the same story kind of holds. And we're going to see that going forward here as we work through the second half of the year, if we get into 2023 and things really do take a turn. But right now, like I said, we're kind of in that trough that's indicating, OK, we're companies we're feeling really good about things over the last six quarters. They're feeling OK right now, but we're starting to see that take a turn and that's something that we're gonna we're gonna track for the second half of the year and as we go into the new year because that's 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 a change for us you know we had a couple good years and um now now that metric is changing again yeah i'll be really interested to see how this all unfolds as the year progresses but this has been really fascinating christine thank you so much for taking the time to do this i hope you'll be back you'll join us again right let's do it yeah, let's do it. Uh, especially, I mean, investors are, are more than likely looking for as much guidance as they can get, right? I mean, uh, navigating these markets has been really, I mean, as you said, these are uncertain times. Very interesting insights. Thank you so much. And for our listeners, you can learn more about today's topic in Wall Street Horizon's webinar presentation, Corporate Body Language, Key Learnings from Corporate Event Data, available to download at no cost at ibkrwebinars.com. Uh, Also, you can get a ton of their insights, including upcoming event dates, as well as stock analyses on IBKR Traders Insight at tradersinsight.news. You may also want to note that the data discussed in this podcast is available via the IBKR API. And until next time, I'm Stephen Levine with Interactive Brokers. Thanks for listening to Traders Insight Radio. As always, there's more content at tradersinsight.news. And if you're interested in learning more about interactive brokers, visit ibkr.com.
We offer more trading education materials such as webinars at ibkrwebinars.com, market-related courses at tradersacademy.online, and quant-related articles at ibkrquant.com. The analysis in this material is provided for information only and is not and should not be construed as an offer to sell or the solicitation of an offer to buy any security. To the extent that this material discusses general market activity, industry, or sector trends, or other broad-based economic or political conditions, it should not be construed as research or investment advice. To the extent that it includes references to specific securities, commodities, currencies, or other instruments. Those references do not constitute a recommendation by IBKR to buy, sell, or hold such investments. The material does not and is not intended to take into account the particular financial conditions, investment objectives, or requirements of individual customers. Before acting on this material, you should consider whether it is suitable for your particular circumstances and is necessary, seek professional advice. The interviewee's employer or associated organization has a business relationship as a client with interactive brokers.